excited to worship together. Uh, we're down a few this morning, unfortunately, but I think there's just a lot of people dealing with a lot of sickness and stuff, so uh, just keep everyone in your prayers. Hannah's not feeling well this morning, so uh, we miss her, but um, we're going to worship together. Uh, we're entering into the holiday season. I hope um, you're excited to celebrate with friends and family. Uh, but we're going to stand this morning. We're going to start off by singing, Are You Washed in the Blood? So let's sing this together. Have you been to Jesus for his cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in his grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments? Spotless are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood? In the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb, are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood? In the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb, are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood? All the people said, Amen. Amen. All right, praise the Lord. I want to read a two passages of Scripture, actually. First, we're going to start off in Luke uh, chapter 1. I want to read verse 1 through 4. Then we're going to skip over to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. And those two kind of go together, and you'll hear a little bit more about that in the, uh, my message. But Luke chapter 1, it says, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account... Of the things accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word have handed them down to us. It seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus, so that you might know the exact truth about the things that you have been taught. And then we'll flip over to 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, where Paul writes to young preacher Timothy and says, All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and training in righteousness, that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Let's pray together. Almighty God and Father in heaven, we are thankful for your word, which we can count on and depend on. It's reliable, it's accurate, and it does exactly what it's intended to do, which is tell us your story of your love for us and point us to eternal life through your son, Jesus Christ, the only way, truth, and life. Lord God, thank you that you love us enough that you sent your word not just words on paper, but the living word 
the Lord Jesus himself. And thank you for men who wrote accurately uh, the truth so that we might know it and can depend on it, Father God. God, I pray today uh, for this service that the Holy Spirit would be our welcome guest here and he might move and work amongst us in our lives and hearts, Lord God, through your word, through the praise and worship. Um, may you be glorified in it all, Father. May our hearts and our minds be prepared to receive what you have for us today. Father God, I pray for those who can't be here. Some are sick and ill. Some are in the hospital. Uh, others may be incarcerated. Uh, Father God, I lift them up and pray your comfort and peace and presence be upon them. And I pray for those, Lord, that find it especially difficult because they've lost loved ones recently in the last year, but maybe even longer, Lord. It's just hard during holiday season. Um, and I pray your comfort and peace upon them. Wrap your loving arms around them and hold them close, Lord, and let them know that you are there with them. Jesus says he never leaves us and he never forsakes us, Lord. Let them feel your divine presence in a special way during this time of the year. Father God, I pray for our country. Pray for our nation, Lord God, and all the things that are happening. Lord God, we know you're in control of it all, and we trust in you in all of it, that it will all be done according to your perfect will and way. But I do lift up and pray for your people, those who are called by your name. God, whether they're in political office, of leadership, own a business, whatever it might be, Lord God, pray that you would allow them to do what is right according to your will and your perfect word, Lord God. Whether they're a mayor, a city councilman, school board member, whatever it might be, Lord God, we lift them up to you. Pray that you would be with them and guide and direct them and that they would seek your guidance and direction, Lord. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for your presence here today. And we pray it in Jesus' blessed and holy name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for joining us today at Eastside Baptist Church. It's good to have you. Uh, this morning and appreciate your presence today. Um, if you're a guest, we're especially glad to have you. There are some uh, visitors bags on the back and the bright yellow sack on that back table. If you would like to get one of those on your way out, you can do that. Uh, I want to thank Delinda Sorrells for decorating our Christmas tree. We sat down and put our heads together and tried to figure out where we could put one. Uh, no room on the stage, but we just said, hey, let's just set it out there in the middle. And uh, she did a great job, and it looks beautiful, and appreciate her effort on that. She also did one back in the fellowship hall as well. Um, on the front of your bulletin, uh, we have the second Sunday of Advent, which is peace. And you can see the two candles lit there. But most of all, um, boy, I thought about this this week, you know, that, that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And man, do we not need peace in this world. I mean, it is chaos, anarchy, basically. And uh, so, think about that this week, about Jesus is our peace. Um, if there is any peace in this world, it's the Lord Jesus Christ himself. The peace that this world offers, it doesn't last long. It's usually temporary, if it's even peace at all. So, remember that as we think about uh, Advent this year and the coming of our Savior. Um, angel tree gifts are due back tomorrow so if you picked up an angel from our angel tree um, you, if you have it today you can turn it in Linda McKeehan is sitting back there at that back table um, if not bring it by the office tomorrow if you can so we can make sure and get those uh, organized and get them delivered as soon as possible um, this morning we are handing out our budget for next year they were handed out in Sunday school classes, and you may not have gotten one of those. They're sitting on this little white back table right in front of the sound booth, so if you want to pick one of those up on your way out so you can see what the budget looks like for next year. Wednesday night, there'll be a, a few here from the uh, Budget and Finance Committee if anybody has any questions, or they're listed there at the bottom of your bulletin on the right-hand side, those that are on the Finance Committee and our treasurer, Neil Carroll, you can call and ask him if you have any questions. We, next Sunday, we'll vote on the budget. Don't, we won't discuss it or anything else. We'll just vote on it uh, to approve it 
or not approve it. So be aware of those things happening in our church uh, for next year. Faith Weaver program next Sunday at 6 p.m. right before our uh, regular business meeting for the month of December. So make aware of that and come a little bit early um, and catch the little program that they are designing for our Faith Weavers for Christmas. And then we get to the insert, which is our Lottie Moon Christmas offering. And there's week of prayer is in there. Uh, prayer guide for you to be able to pray for missionaries each day of the week this week. And, um, and then also give, there is an envelope in there uh, for all the monies that's collected up for Lottie Moon Christmas offering, all of it, every penny goes to the missionaries. No overhead, no administrative costs, no nothing. They always use Lottie Moon Christmas offering just to support and help the missionaries in their work. So just be aware of that. Be in prayer what, what God would have you to give to support. And our Women on Missions, which I really appreciate, set our goal this year for $3,000. And I'm going to ask Wilma Lee to come up right now, and she's going to say our prayer uh, for this Sunday, and then we'll have a Lottie Moon Christmas uh, mission video that we'll watch. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention also, we, are, we have adopted for just the month of December missionary Stacy Powers. She's a missionary in Africa and Zambia. And so we're also uh, asking that you remember to pray for Stacy and her ministry in Africa as well. So I appreciate Miss Wilma and all that our Women on Missions does. And I, I want to tell any ladies here that if you're interested in doing the work of Christ, get involved in Women on Missions. They are doing it. They do missions. They f give out uh, food. They they do all kinds of mission work right here in our community and support our missionaries and other things as well. So I encourage you to be involved in that if you can. All right, Miss Wilma, well, I think that's on. You hit the button and you're ready. We're also a fun group, so everyone's invited. Now, if you'll pray with me. Our Lord, we just come to you today thanking you for so many things. We especially thank you for sending Jesus as a baby to die for us and then have him grow up and die for us as a sacrifice for the world. We thank you for this season and help us remember why we celebrate, Lord. Lord, we thank you for the missionaries that Lottie Moon supports, and we thank you for their willingness to answer your call and go to, the, to other places in the world. We also thank you for those missionaries that are here in Texas because so many of the world are coming to Texas, Lord, and we just ask you to be with those missionaries here in Texas and in our country, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity to give to Lottie Moon Crip Christmas offering, Lord, and we ask you to be with us as we pray about what we should give, and we want to follow your will. We thank you that we have this opportunity to be a part of the missionaries in other parts of the world. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. It's been a tough year. Famine and disease. Political strife. Security barricades have apparently been breached outside the Capitol building. Economic hardships. Natural disasters. It's been a tough, hard, relentless year. But the challenges of today do not define us. We know the glorious and victorious ending to the grand narrative that transcends the earth, all time all things. The loudest voices may take the day, but the meek shall inherit the earth. Disease and pandemic may ravage, but he will wipe away every tear. Lockdowns and travel bans may ensue, but his purposes cannot be thwarted. Men and women may fail, morally, spiritually, miserably, but the light overcomes the darkness. The heartbeat of God's people is the vision he's given us 
in Revelation 7, verses 9 and 10. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Hear the echoes of the saints who have gone before us, the giants whose shoulders we now stand upon. It's a groundswell of ascent, a solidarity born of one accord, a consensus worthy of pursuit. We are united for the sake of this cause to see the world transformed by the gospel. The name of Jesus proclaimed in every corner of the earth. We will not let the hands, the voice, the lies of a defeated enemy divide us. Together, we will advance the kingdom of God. We give ourselves to this mission every day. And as we continue in worship, kind of along the lines of what he just said, uh, we're going to sing O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. And this song, something I was kind of thinking of here the past week um, with this song, in anticipation of Jesus coming, the first, well, let me just start by saying this. How, how many times do you feel like, I feel like it's very common for me, how many times with music, with songs, whether they're 10 years old, 15 years old, 50, 100 years old, how many times with songs do we relate those songs with situations or people or family members that we know? I remember when this person always sang this song, right? And those aren't bad things, but a lot of times those, those things can sweep away the meaning of the true, the true meaning of the song that we're singing. And so I even have that whenever I think of some songs that I heard as a kid, um, you know, it takes me back to when I was at camp or something like that. Um, but as we sing these songs and as we come in on Sunday mornings and go back and maybe hit some of those songs that bring back some memories and things, we have to keep on the forefront of our mind of why we're singing them. And this is one of them. And I think Christmas songs are especially in that category where we think of Christmas. We think of family and trees and lights. Um, but with this song in the first verse, O come, O come, Emmanuel. It's it's such a great um, a great song and uh, ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile. So if you think we're exiled, we're we're there, Israel was alone and and desperate and cast out, and they're they're pleading, come, Emmanuel, come for us. We need you to deliver us. And that's our prayer today as well, and prayer for Christ to return and get us out of here, right? <laughs> um, and so that's the kind of hope that we're looking towards, O come, O come, Emmanuel. And then, Cliff, if you would put up the last verse, the last verse of the song that we're going to sing this morning is, O come, desire, so come, desire in our hearts, we're asking desire God, give us a desire of nations to bind. Go to the next slide for me, Cliff. All peoples in one heart and mind. And that we bind every strife and all the quarrels, all the bickering and fighting would stop. Go ahead and send the next slide. By envy, strife, quarrels cease. And then the last slide, fill the whole world with heavens, with heavenly peace. And so as we sing this, I hope that's what's going through our mind and our heart. Uh, just an anticipation for Jesus, a hope for Jesus that we have in him. And that we as followers of Christ would bind no matter our, our differences and our bickering and fighting, whatever it may be, as long as Christ is our Savior, and he's the center of our lives. We can bind around that. So let's sing that together. O come, O come, Emmanuel.
Disperse the gloomy clouds of night in this dark shadow put to fly. Rejoice, rejoice, ye men who will shall come to thee. Stand and sing that chorus one more time. Rejoice, rejoice, ye men do well, shall come to thee, O Israel, shall come to thee. God sent his son God sent his son They called him Jesus He came to love Heal and forgive He bled Gives way to victory. I'll see the lights of glory, and I'll know He lives. Sing 
it together. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I Sing, I cast my mind to Calvary. Cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone. Messiah still and Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore. For endless days we will sing your praise, O oh Lord, O oh Lord our God. And on at break of dawn. This is why we celebrate. Son of heaven rose again. Oh, trample death. Where is your sting? The angels roar for Christ the King. And oh, sun shall pierce the night and I will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed in Jesus' face and oh praise the sing your praise this morning. And we sing it from our hearts and not just from our mouths. God, and I pray that you would take this message that Brother Stephen has prepared, God, and use it to challenge us, to equip us, to open our minds and hearts to what you have for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Right. 
Luke chapter 1, that's where we're going to camp out a little bit. Pretty much everybody, I know all of you, talk about preaching to the choir, uh, knows the Christmas story, but we're going to look at it again, look at a few things, God may reveal something a little different to you. Um, Before I do, I wanted to give a shout out to the Baylor Bears in the room. We got some of them wearing green, wearing rings, all that. Um, You know, it's all, uh, it's all good, right? Amen. Okay. So, uh, great game. I didn't watch it. Um, Had something better to do, I guess you could say. I took the heater box out of my truck, spent all afternoon doing that. So, anyways, uh, <laughs> football, I used to be really want to watch everything. I don't watch it as much anymore. Um, I still like to, but it's not like I used to. It's just not the same since uh, the old Cowboys, you know. Then you had to. I can remember when I was a kid in high school pulling up First Baptist Granbury to the parking lot at 6, and there would be cars all out in the parking lot, and everybody was still in their car because they were listening to the last, you know, and it was always back in those days, it seemed like right up to the end of the game before you knew who was going to win. And as soon as, like, either the Cowboys scored or didn't score or whatever, everybody would jump up and run inside. And uh, I remember that. I remember those things. So, anyways, uh, unexpected visitor. And um, sometimes we have those. I've had them. Um, you know, when you're laying down Sunday afternoon for a nap, everybody's quiet, and the doorbell rings. Uh, that's an unexpected visitor, right? Nobody expected that. And it, it could be some uh, uh, something important, but it could be a kid from the neighborhood. I don't know why this is, but if your wife's a school teacher. Uh, kids stop by and ring the doorbell and want a drink of water. You know, Miss Oldy, can I get a drink? I'm hot. And, okay, you know, whatever. So uh, we get a lot, of, we get that sometimes. And the dogs start barking and nap time's over. That's the end of it right there. Uh, and that's what I'm, that's kind of my message. Um, you know, when it's an unexpected visitor, you never know who it is. Um, you know, kind of the uh, knock, knock joke kind of a thing um who is it who's there we don't know who who it might be um and that's the way it is sometimes and that's really what happens in this passage and interestingly enough in the songs west picked and everything fit right in with that perfectly because at this point in time in the nation of israel they have been waiting and waiting, and waiting, and waiting. Literally for 400 years, there had been absolutely no prophetic voice at all. No word from God to his people at all. And people that were very uh, committed to God and following him, um, and they were praying, uh, seeking his will, seeking his presence, like Zacharias, like Elizabeth and others, and uh, just wanting some, some message from God. And, um, and then all of a sudden, here it comes. And that's why I read Luke 1 through 4 and read uh, the passage. And I'm going to read quite a bit of this scripture. So I'm going to start off by reading 1 through 4 again. And, uh, and then we'll remember what we read in 2 Timothy 3. Verse 16 and 17. So if you would, let's stand in honor of reading God's word. We'll have quite a few other passages because it's mostly all about Luke chapter 1. But uh, just as a reminder, because it's so important. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word have handed them down to us, It seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus, so that you might know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. May God bless the reading and the understanding of his word. You may be seated. And that's where we're at. 
uh, in this passage. There's an implication here that goes along with what we read and what we read earlier in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 where it says all scripture is God-breathed, okay? Um, it is God moving and working in his word to bring it to us so that we have it in a way just like uh, it is written here by Luke so that you may know the truth and you can depend on it. And we've been saying that here off and on. And it's so awesome that we have discoveries and archaeology, things that are in, especially in Israel and in that region. They're constantly finding uh, things that prove Scripture and verify the accuracy of God's Word. And, uh, but I don't need that, and I hope you don't either. Um, I'd, I take it because... God said it was his inspired word. And so that's all I need. The other stuff, it kind of, yeah, it's good. It verifies it, it. But I don't have to have that. But the implication for us is, in what Luke is writing here is, he says, um, eyewitnesses and the servants, and that word was handed down, and it seemed fitting for me, having investigated everything. Luke was a physician. Very educated for his time. And he apparently went on a mission to verify statements, look uh, and, and interview people who saw and wrote it all down as, as accurate as he could, led by the Holy Spirit. That's what we read in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 that came upon him and helped him be able to document and to write and get it exactly the way that it needed to be and um, being used by God, and guess what? Um, they wrote it down. Because word of mouth is good, but it's better to have written word. And it was all because of the Holy Spirit moving and working. And the implication for us is studying and reading God's word is important. It's good. It can help verify. It can help us understand. It's not going to save you. Although you can read God's word and get saved. But the purpose of the word is to give you understanding and insight into who God is and how much he loves us. And there's, right here from Luke, critical testimony that it's good for us to look at, study, and read his word. So I encourage you to do that. Get in a Bible study class. Get in a Sunday school class, small group. Read the word on your own. Whatever you need to do to make the word part of your life. Because we're at a critical stage in America. Um, literally from what I'm reading, um, we are more biblically illiterate in this country than we've ever been since it, this country began. Fewer people are reading their Bibles. Fewer people know and, and uh, have an uh, understanding of what's in God's word. And we even had Andy Stanley not too long ago, Charles' son, who pastors a mega church in uh, uh, the suburbs of Atlanta, say, we need to stop saying the Bible says. And he got in a lot of trouble and caught a lot of flack over that. But if you read the whole statement, I understand what he was saying is, the, re the reason he says that is because today, under 40, most people, and that's his target audience for his church is young people, they don't know what the Bible says. So when you say the Bible says, that doesn't mean one thing to them. Uh, it's probably more important to give testimony about what God has done in your life as a personal testimony. Um, and it makes sense because, guess what? The New Testament church, those believers, they didn't have the Bible. So how did they witness? How did they share? They gave their testimony of faith and how God had acted in their life and what Jesus and a personal relationship had done with them. The word came later. So, wanted to get that started uh, first to help us. So, who's this first visitor? Look at verse 5. We see the angel Gabriel. And appreciate Wes getting us a nice angel up there uh, for our uh, unexpected guest. And pretty much, I think we could all agree, if an angel appeared, that'd be pretty unexpected, wouldn't it? I mean, I would. Uh, and I always love it when angels appear and they always say, fear not. I just want you to know if an angel appears in my living room, I'm fearing, okay? I'm just like, whoa, that's, 
probably going to roll me off my couch and who knows what else will happen. But look at verse 5, and it says, In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Uh, Let me just stop right there for a minute. When it says the days of Herod, I thought about this a little bit, and that's not a good thing, okay? It's not like, woohoo, the days of Herod, it's like, Okay, I don't want to offend anybody, but this is what came to my mind, okay? It's like if somebody said, the days of Jimmy Carter. (laughs) Remember those days? Okay. There was a lot more Democrats back then, too, in Texas, but uh, I I was old enough just barely to remember the days of Jimmy Carter. And uh, he's a good man, Christian man, but not much of a president. Um, and had had some major problems and things there. But uh, that's the way it was just bleak, not just economy-wise, but spiritually as well. That's what they're saying in the days of Herod. Because Herod thought nothing of religion. He could care less about any of that. He was there for his name and political gain and all those kinds of things. So it was a great time of discouragement, if you will. Let me go on and read a little bit more. And they were both righteous in the sight of God, that's Zacharias and Elizabeth, walking blamelessly in the commandments and requirements of the Lord. And they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and they were both advanced in years. So to make matters worse, the worst thing that could happen to you as people in that day and age was to not have any children. Basically, it... And that, the way they thought in the ancient world was you were cursed. You had a curse upon you because you had not had any children. And for especially for the female, um, it, was, it meant you had no heirs. It meant, I mean, after you die, that's it. The end of your, life, your family is over. It was just a horrible thing. And so they're living in this, number one, things are bad. Roman Empire rules the world. Uh, the actual faith and religion of Israel was on the decline. Um, there hadn't been a voice or a message or anything, a word from God in over 400 years. It was just kind of blah. And no children on top of that. The message of this is in times of discouragement, hang on. Hang on. God's right around the corner. You never know when he's going to appear suddenly, an unexpected guest, and do something incredible in your life. It goes on in verse 8, it says, Now it came about while he was performing his priestly duties before God in the appointed order of his division, according to the customs of the priestly office, who was chosen by lot. Yes, they actually cast dice to see who, who got to go into the... Uh, holy place and light the incense and the whole multitude of the people were in prayer outside at the hour of the incense offering so there's lots of people they cast ice it comes up Zacharias is the one that goes in and something incredible is going to happen and here's the thing despite the bleakness of the situation despite how discouraging it was despite no word from God at all, even though they've been praying and praying and praying and praying and serving God. They kept on serving. They didn't go, okay, it's not worth it. I give up. I quit. They kept on keeping on. And they believed that eventually, sometime, they were going to see deliverance. They were going to see a blessing from God. And they knew it was coming. They didn't know when. They didn't even know if it was in their lifetime. But they were going to keep on serving the Lord no matter what. And that's kind of the uh, refrain of what we're saying with the times that we see in our nation. It really doesn't matter who's president or what kind of government we have. We are called to continue to be God's people no matter what and no, and no matter the situation no matter who's in control or who rules the country or any of that, good or bad, we're called to keep on 
serving God, even in the midst of discouragement. It reminded me of a story I heard one time about Mark Martin, a a NASCAR driver in the Hall of Fame. Uh, In 1997, he was driving at Talladega. That's the big one, two and a half mile uh, super speedway, go usually over 200 miles an hour. And he had a wreck. And during the wreck, the guy, the spotter and the crew chief and all them, they're trying to talk to him. And I mean, this is one of them big ones where they're flipping and flying and all this stuff. And they're trying to talk to him, and they're like, Mark, you know, do this, don't do that. You know, are you okay, whatever. And in the middle of that, and they have this on recording, in the middle of all that chaos, he literally comes over his microphone and says, I can't talk right now, I'm still crashing. (laughs) Have any of y'all ever felt like that? You know, you don't want to talk to anybody. Don't, you know, take... In the old days, see, here, this is why I don't like a lot of the new stuff. Because remember in the old days when you didn't want to talk to anybody, remember what you did? Took the phone off the hook. Remember that? Sunday afternoon, uh, take the phone off the hook, put a pillow over it. You're not listening to any of that. Now we sleep with our phone. You know, it goes with us everywhere. But... In the midst of all the chaos and discouragement and everything, hey, God's still there. He knows exactly what's going on, and he wants his people to hang on and just keep going. Verse 13 through 17, it is basically a passage of hope. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid. Of course, I'm glad angels say that when they appear before you. Your petition has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and will give him the name John. And you will have joy and gladness and will rejoice at his birth. Now, that's what I call an answer to prayer. Amen? Joy and gladness and rejoice at his birth. Something that is a complete and utter miracle. And the angel gives these words of comfort. To them, basically, what the angel Gabriel says is, your prayers have been heard, and they've been answered. Amen? Amen. I love that. So, that's the first visitor, Gabriel to Zacharias. The second visitor is the angel that visits Mary. Skip on down through that same chapter, and there's a lot there, and you may want to go back and read through some of this. But look at verse 26. Through 33, now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God. So six months later, the angel Gabriel then goes and appears to someone else unexpectedly in the city of Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, Hail, favored one. The Lord is with you. In the Greek, the translation is better, the Lord has graced you. Mm. Mm -hmm -hmm. But she was greatly troubled at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this might be. And the angel said to her, don't be afraid, Mary. There we go, because I'm afraid if an angel appears. Don't be afraid, Mary, for you found favor with God. I'm just going to tell y'all people, okay, typical Baptist, okay, Um, in reaction to what the Catholics have done with Mary, which is elevator almost to the point of worship, we tend to go the opposite direction to let's totally ignore her. But I'm telling you that Mary was a very special person chosen specifically by God to do something incredible. The angel said, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And think about what it was, what her life was that she had found favor with God. By the way, pretty much all the theologians believe that Mary was probably 14 years old, maybe 15. Behold, you'll conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call him Jesus. 
He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. And Mary said to the angel, How can this be since I know no man, for I'm a virgin? How can it be? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the holy offspring shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age, and she was called barren, who was called barren, is now in her sixth month, for nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord, be it done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from me. Behold, the bond slave of the Lord, a servant of the Lord God. Chosen by him. In verse 37. For nothing will be impossible with God. Mary's question is how can this be? How can it happen? It's impossible. It's impossible. For man. But everything is possible with God. Amen. The angel came in. I want to make this very clear in verse 28. The angel was invited in. God never forces his way into your life. He'll never do it. The angel came in because they were welcomed. They were invited. And in verse 31, we see the name. Jesus. Yeshua. Joshua which means Yahweh is salvation. The Son of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. Verse 37 is the key to the whole passage. Nothing is impossible with God. Nothing. Nothing is impossible with God. The key to verse 37 is faith. It's believing and trusting in God. And no matter what situation, no matter how bleak, how depressing, how horrible, no matter who's president, no matter what country you're in, no matter what's going on, nothing is impossible with God. Look at, look at Mary's statement in verse 38. Behold, uh, the bond slave of the Lord, be it done according to your word. That's faith. God, I trust you. Whatever you're going to do, I believe you're going to do it. And I'll just keep on living just exactly like that. Forsaking all, I trust him. Faith. I'm going to trust him. How can this happen? The answer is a miracle. When you, when it look, you're up against it, and there's no hope, and it doesn't look like there's any solution or any answers, and you don't know what's going to do, what's going to come next. How, how am I going to resolve this? There, there's nothing. I don't, know, I don't see any way out of this situation. Nothing is impossible with God. Nothing. So we have the angel that visits Zechariah. Then we have the second visitor, which is the angel, Gabriel, same angel, visits Mary. Then we have the third visit, which is Mary visits Elizabeth in verse 39. Now at this time, Mary arose and went with haste to the hill country to a city of Judah and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And uh, this whole passage all the way through verse 66 um, is her encounter and what's happening in her life. All the way through, I want to read through. 45 right now and it came about when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting the baby leaped in her womb six months old John the Baptist already preaching his first sermon Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and she cried out with a loud voice and said blessed among women are you and blessed is the fruit of your womb and how has it happened to me that the mother of my Lord she already recognized Just saw her, just walked in the door. Don't miss this, folks. That tells you something about the spiritual life of Elizabeth. 
I mean, the reason God picked these people is because they were like that. That's why. So immediately, Elizabeth and the reaction of the child in her womb was to worship. My Lord and my God, the mother of my Lord should come to me. For behold, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. Um, the baby in her womb leapt, leapt for joy. Wow, that's so awesome. You know, I get to feel uh, my, my daughter Shelby's belly and felt a few little kicks in there and everything. Can you imagine? It's just, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Glory. Yeah. The place of Mary. What do you do with Mary? And like I said, in response to the zeal of the Catholic Church, we kind of evangelicals kind of went the opposite way to let's just ignore it, let's be ignorant of it. But the reality is Mary holds a very special place in the story of the Lord. She was chosen specifically by God because she had that same relationship as a 14-year-old teenage girl. How can this be? Well, it's a miracle. The Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. Oh, well then, okay. Okay, let's do this. In 431, the Council of Ephesus, Council of Religious Leaders at that time, that were trying to set the doctrines and beliefs of the church, came up with a term. They went back and forth over the term, what shall we call Mary? How shall we label her? Who was she? And they came up with the term first, Christokos, which means bearer of Christ. But then they changed it, and then they came up with the Theotokos, bearer of God. And in the Latin, it translates, Mother of God. Now, I can tell you the Reformers, they did not like it. They didn't like it because it's like, a mm, little too much for Mary there. But they accepted it. And I'll tell you why they accepted it. Because it spoke about the deity of Christ. Let me tell you something. There's a movement in this country and in this world that wants to make Jesus just another human being oh a special human being a good human being maybe even somebody that did some miracles had a great faith they want to say that Jesus was unique he was a great teacher he, he, he was a great healer but the one thing they don't want to say about Jesus is that he is God and the reason these early church reformers accepted the term mother of God is because they knew and realized that they had to say about Jesus that he was God. God in the flesh. John Calvin had many reservations and wrote about it, but he understood the doctrinal truth behind the statement that Mary was the mother of God. 1 Timothy 3.16 says this. I'm going to read verse 15 and 16. It's Paul writing. He says, But in case I'm delayed, I write so that you may know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, in the church, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. Let me tell you something. When people say, well, I can be a Christian and a Christ follower and a follower of Jesus, but I am not going to go to church. Paul says, baloney. You are, you are part of the problem that is happening in this country because part of the church, and maybe the church isn't doing what it's supposed to be doing, but what Paul is saying here is that the church is the pillar that supports the truth. In other words, it's real easy as people begin to get away from God's word, don't really know what it says. I've had people all the time come up to me and say, Preacher, the, the Bible says this, or where do you find that in the Bible? And a lot of times I'll say, that's not in the Bible. 
I don't know where you heard it. I don't know who told you that. I'm not sure where you read that. But that's not in the Scriptures. Because the Scriptures is God-breathed. We just talked about that. Paul is saying that the church is the pillar that supports the truth. That's the purpose of the church. Is to hold fast to the word of God and his truth. Verse 16, and by common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. The incarnation. How can a 14-year-old teenage girl become pregnant? It's a mystery. It's a mystery. You can't explain it. You can't understand it. Why? Because it's a miracle. Amen? God did it. And it's a miracle. That's the incarnation. That is Emmanuel, Christ with us. So, Zacharias and Elizabeth have been praying, petitioning God. Do something in our midst. Reveal yourself. Show us who you are. By the way, God, we'd really love to have a child and heir. And he answers their prayers. And he gives them joy and gladness and rejoicing. And then here comes the unexpected visitors. Mary sees Elizabeth. Verse 42, she's called blessed among women. Doesn't say blessed above women. Doesn't say you're the most blessed woman ever, although she may be. Blessed among women. Blessed are you because blessed is the fruit of your womb. There's no doubt in my mind that Mary walked with the Lord in a very unique and special way as a 14-year-old teenage girl. But I also know that once God chose her, she was blessed because she carried the Son of God in her womb. Verse 43, Elizabeth calls her the mother of my Lord, which is a proper title. Verse 46 through 55 is called the Magnificent. In Latin, it means to magnify, where she just exalts and glorifies the Lord. She gives all praise and glory to God the Father and declares God is her Savior. Verse 46 through 55, And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, My soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior, for he has regard for the humble state of his bond slave. For behold, from this time on, all generations will count me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name, and his mercy is upon generation after generation towards those who fear him. He has done mighty deeds with his arm, and he has scattered those who were proud in thoughts of their heart. He has brought down rulers from their thrones and has exalted those who were humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent away the rich empty-handed. He has given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his offspring forever. And Mary stayed with her about three months and then returned to her home. Now, if it was six months plus three months, okay, she stayed until John was born and then she went back home is what happened. Mary, just like us, needs a Savior. She declares that God is her Savior. Jesus, Yahweh, is salvation. There's at least ten quotes of Old Testament Scripture in this psalm, if you will, that Mary wrote, this prayer song of praise to God. What does that say about a mother who teaches her family, her children, about God's word? Raise up a child in the ways of the Lord. And when they're old, they will not depart from them, and then you will be blessed. The fourth and final visitor, God visits his people. Verse 67 through verse 75. It's really all the way through 80. It's Emmanuel. It's God with us. Zacharias then prophesies of John's ministry. By the way, when John's born, remember Zacharias would kind of, he wasn't like Mary. He was like, now wait a minute, how's this going to happen? And he had some doubts, and so he lost his voice and couldn't talk till the baby was born. And they were trying to name the baby, and 
uh, Elizabeth was coming out with some names, and all of a sudden, here comes Zachariah's voice back, and he says, the baby's name will be John. That's what the angel had told him. Oops, should have listened to the angel in, to begin with, right? Finally gets his voice back. Here's his word of prophecy, and his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, remember now, all this, Luke investigated it, researched it, and then wrote it out very carefully, led and guided every step of the way by the Holy Spirit. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited us. Unexpected visitor. God himself, Emmanuel, God came down and visited us. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited us and accomplished redemption for his people. He paid for our salvation through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. And he raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David, his servant, and he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from old. He's been telling this for years, decades, centuries, that he was going to do it, and now he has done it to show mercy towards our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to Abraham, our father, to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear and holiness and righteousness before him all of our days. How do we do it? We have a relationship with his son. Jesus Christ. What enemies are he talking about that we've been delivered from? Fear, death, and the grave. We don't have to fear dying. We don't have to fear the grave. We don't have to fear fear. We don't even have to fear the angel when it appears in our living room. Because God's dealt with all that for us through his son, Jesus Christ. The fourth visitor is God visiting his people and he visited us and he redeemed us revelation 320 says behold i stand at the door and knock if anyone hears my voice and opens the door i will come in wes if you can put up that that picture were you able to get that some of you have seen this picture before it's a, very, it's a very famous painting that was done in 1850s by Warner Salmon. It's a actually the second most popular of his paintings. Uh, this one's entitled Christ at Heart's Door. And the first painting he did sold, uh, it's called Head of Christ. Some of you may have seen that. It sold over 500 million copies. The original of this picture hangs in Krebs College in Oxford in England. Notice a couple of things about it. First of all, there's a, a peephole so you can see who's on the outside. But you can also see what's on the inside. What's on the inside? Huh? Well, no, but you can see through the peephole what's in there. Darkness. There is no doorknob because just like the angel... Jesus won't force his way in. You have to invite him in. The title of the painting is Christ at, heart, Christ at Our Heart's Door. The picture itself says, Behold, I stand at the, no the door and knock. In this passage that we've read at Luke chapter 1 this morning, it's basically just telling us that God loves us. And he sent his son Jesus to die on a cross for us. And he's done everything that he needs to do for you and you and you and me and all of us to have a relationship with God the Father. He's paid the price for all of us. But Jesus won't barge in. He's not kicking the door in. He's going to stand at the door and knock. We can look out and see his face and see who he is, the son of God that came to love us and take away the sins of the world. The question is, who's knocking at your door? And are you listening? Let's bow our heads and close our eyes.
Almighty God. Thank you for loving us. And thank you for sending Jesus. Help us to understand the work of the church and the importance of all of us who have been called by you to share your love with others. Lord, use this time to help us look at our heart and see if we've ever invited our Savior in. Because if we have, then our life will never be the same. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask everybody just to stay seated today. I want you to just reflect and ponder the question, who's knocking at your heart's door? And have you ever invited him in? That's it. I'll be here at the front if you want to respond in any way. May not want to come today. Come this week. Come talk to me at the office. Call me. Come by the house. Whatever you want to do. I would love to talk with anybody about their eternity. Because it's either heaven or hell. That's it. There's no other places. It's heaven or hell. And if you've never opened your heart's door and let Jesus into your life, then there's only one way you can go. Make sure you know that you know that you know the Son of God who came to take away the sins of the world. Wes and the praise team's going to sing. You sit quietly, pray and talk to the Lord and let him talk to you. We'll close in just a moment. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted because you were condemned. And time alive, well, the Spirit. died and rose again. And I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. And I'm accepted because you were condemned. And I'm alive and well, the Spirit is within me. Because you died and rose again. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? It's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you. And I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. And I'm accepted. You were condemned. And I'm alive and well, the Spirit is within me, because you died and rose again. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love.
It's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you. You are my king. You are my king. Jesus, you. Jesus, you are my King. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true. It's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true, and it's my joy to honor you in all I do, I honor you. God, I pray that we honor you with our lives, not only on Sundays, but God, as we live, God, as we live our, li uh, our lives out as followers. God, I pray that we live them in honor of you. God, strengthen us as we go. Bind us together in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.